Welcome back to my unhinged recap of Desperate Housewives. Today we cover season five. Before we dive in, I want to say thank you to two very special people. Um, my beloved oomph, Plain Jane, and also Maddie for contributing to my Kofi and helping fund this video. Thank you so, 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 so much for the support. I really, really appreciate it. Also, I hit 500 subscribers, which means I can apply for like the first stage of YouTube partnership. So at some point in the near future, I hope to have a super thanks button down below. Um, but for now, I'll keep my Kofi, Kofi in the description. Um, you can go there and support season six's video if you so choose. Yeah, it's a new year, new me, doing worse than ever, but we made it. Did, did you ever think it would go this far? No, I think that if I, if I, if I had known that back then, I probably would have killed myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Since we're just like not having a really good time right now, I decided that when I film, I'm going to put on my fun little bracelets I made um, over Christmas and that will be something to kind of cheer me up. My youngest sister is a Swifty, so that means she has a bunch of beads. Um, I'm going to show you because I made a few that are Desperate Housewives themed. First, we have an Edie Britt bracelet. I accidentally put the T's on upside down, but my sister wanted me to get out of her room, so I didn't get to fix it. Next, I made a Lynette bracelet, and I tried to make it as if her kids made it for her. This is a Brie Vandekamp bracelet. Um, there's also a lesbian flag. This one is a Dana Scully bracelet. Last but not least, we have my Carmelfi bracelet, which is very classy and says Carmelfi. To get us started with season five, I'm gonna go over a few of the new pictures on the wall just to kind of catch us up. I didn't discuss the kids at all last time, even though they're shown in the season four finale. So here is Celia and Juanita Solis, and here is MJ Delfino. We made it through season four. This means we have survived a lot of things, including cancer, kidnappings, arson, murder attempts, breakups, cheating, divorce, driving our car into a lake. We've survived a really creepy pharmacist. We have survived a tornado. We have survived love and loss of female friendship. As we dive into season five, episode one, a stunning realization hits us. It's very possible that Mike Delfino is dead. We know from the season four finale that Susan is now with a man who is not Mike. Who the fuck is this guy and where is Mike? They just got married last season. We open with a sort of flashback to a very important day in Susan Delfino's life. We meet a woman named Lila who has a daughter named Paige. Here is Lila and Paige. Susan and Lila, despite giving birth in the same hospital and living in the same town, have never met until this fateful day when their cars collide. In the present day, Susan is indeed with a man who is not Mike. His name is Jackson. Here he is. I don't have too much to say about Jackson. I mean, he's just kind of there to date Susan, so... Uh, anyway, Susan is keeping her new man a secret from everyone. And the thing that's really interesting is that men are just always lusting after Susan for some reason. Anyway, come to find out Mike is not dead. They just got divorced because the car accident put a lot of stress on their marriage and they couldn't take it, so they broke up. Now Susan is dating someone new and that's that. Over in the Solis household, Gabby is a mother and uh, her first subplot is about how she's upset because when she takes Juanita shopping, the storekeeper says that Juanita's too big to fit into the sizes they have. And so the conflict for Gabby is like, oh no, oh no, she has a daughter who does not fit Gabby's conventional beauty. This actress, Madison de la Garza, who is so perfect as Juanita, absolutely wonderful, consistently provides some of the funniest moments on the show because she is so, so real in the same way that Parker in earlier seasons just really captured the vibe of the family so well. She is incredible. Um, but unfortunately, her mental health suffered a lot because of bullying that she received on the show. And this no doubt includes things that came right out of the writer's room and were fed to her and to her scene partners in the various episodes where her weight is a topic. So this plot for Gabby is kind of her being in denial about the way her daughter looks and she gets mad anytime anyone insinuates there's anything wrong with her daughter. So I don't know if the purpose of this is to show that like Gabby doesn't only care about looks anymore, she's so brave. 
or accepting her child the way she what i don't know it's a little weird and just not necessary um there are better ways to show gabby's growth than making this child go through all of this let's jump over to the scavos the twins host a gambling night at the pizza parlor and they are running a poker game tom is having another midlife crisis so his first midlife crisis led them to open the pizzeria and now his second midlife crisis made him buy a car and he's just not quite happy tom is also not great at playing bad cop with the teenage twins and more than ever they need a bad cop in the house besides lynette because she just cannot do all that by herself they want to go out to the school dance but Lynette doesn't want them to because they need to be grounded for the poker game but Tom thinks that it's okay if they go out so Lynette gives them the keys to Tom's car and it's only when they get home a little later than they promised they would in Tom's new fancy car that he fixed up that he decides he does have a problem with it and needs to play bad cop. For Brie Vandekamp, Brie has a cookbook released called Mrs. Vandekamp's Old Fashioned Cooking. Her and Catherine's business has been very successful. She is a full-on girl boss now and she dedicated the cookbook to Catherine. However, Catherine's upset because Brie took some of their catering company's recipes and used them in the book and some of those are Catherine's. Brie really cares a lot about this business and for a moment it almost seems like she is putting it above everything else and this is when we learned that during that five years that passed danielle came and took benjamin from brie saying that she was ready to raise him on her own so brie lost her son slash grandson that meant she had no one else so she took orson back and put everything she had into her business finally we have someone new on the link this man named Dave, here he is, shows up at a random house on Wisteria Lane and offers to buy it from the man who owns it. He wants to buy it right now. So he buys this house, it all works out, and he's ready to bring his wife and show her their new home. His wife is Edie Britt. Dave somehow convinced her to move back to Wisteria Lane. He gets her old house for her and they are ready to continue life on the lane. This means after the falling out that the girls had with Edie in season four, she took a little over five years away, and now she is coming back to Wisteria Lane with her new husband, Dave. Dave is an angry, angry man. Um, he seems polite and nice enough on the outside, but uh, we soon learn from Mary Alice's voiceover, as well as his glaring looks down the lane, that Dave is after someone on Wisteria Lane. Who? Why? We don't know yet. Season five, episode two. Okay, we're gonna start with the Solises because this episode we learned that Gabby is sad because they are poor so they can't go to parties anymore. This kind of kicks off the era of Gabby and Carlos being broke as fuck. Because Carlos is now blind, he is not able to return to the job he had before the tornado. So, so this really puts a strain on their finances. On top of the fact they have two girls now. Lynette has started to feel like she doesn't really know her kids anymore, especially Porter. Um, when the kids were young, they were all really close and she felt really connected to them. But now she has sort of lost that touch with them and she wants to get it back. So she creates an account on a website that is sort of like Facebook slash MySpace um, slash AIM, I would say. She doesn't create the profile as Lynette Scavo because she figures he wouldn't accept her request that way. So she creates a fake persona um, and she is a high school girl. They end up chatting about all kinds of things, but Lynette learns that Porter is really into poetry and he writes beautiful poetry. Lynette thinks that is really sweet, so she really encourages him in his messages. Again, with him not knowing that this is actually Lynette he's talking to. Well, one day Porter confesses to this fellow high schooler that he has a crush on her. So Lynette has to tell Tom what she did. He is not very impressed with her. Lynette writes a really sweet rejection message back and she shows Tom once it's sent and she accidentally signed it, love mom. So her cover is blown and this creates new issues with Porter because now he doesn't trust her. All right, let's talk about Susan. So we're still really getting to the group of season five. The beginning of this season is all about getting us established in this new timeline. In this episode, Mike and Jackson meet for the first time. They actually get along really well and they become buddies, which Susan is a little nervous about, but 
she's happy that it didn't create issues when she introduced Jackson to Mike. Now for Edie and Dave. So Edie and Mrs. McCluskey have a sort of fight in this episode, and it really upsets Edie and makes her feel like she's not welcome in the neighborhood. Dave approaches Mrs. McCluskey and asks her to apologize for it, but she says that that's the way her and Edie have always talked. They always have a little fight, but Edie knows that she cares about her and that she loves her and considers her a friend. Dave does not take this as an explanation. He insinuates that some harm may be done. You may recall Toby is now being cared for by Mrs. McCluskey after Ida Greenberg, who was Toby's original owner, died in the season four tornado. Toby goes missing. Dave stops by and tells Mrs. McCluskey that he will help her look for Toby if she apologizes. In this episode, everyone on the lane is trying to get to know Dave a little bit, but he is very mysterious. He really won't answer a lot of questions about where he's originally from or where he went to college or really like the details of how he and Edie met. And so Mrs. McCluskey, because she is pissed about this man being weird and possibly, allegedly hiding her cat from her, she decides that she is going to go on the computer and do a little bit of research about this Dave fella. Orson is upset that the name on Bree's book is Vandekamp as opposed to Mrs. Hodge. When she goes on a radio show to do some publicity for the book, the host asks her if there is a Mr. Vandekamp, and she says, oh no, Mr. Vandekamp is dead. But there is a Mr. Hodge, but she doesn't talk about that. So Orson confronts her about that. He is not very pleased with her. But Brie got into the publication process when Orson was in jail for running Mike over. So it turns out he did indeed take Brie's terms, which were he had to give himself up, come clean to the police if she were to consider taking him back. Since Orson held up his end of that bargain, he feels that Brie needs to treat him a little better than she is. So when she gets home from a long work day, I'm talking like really late, and she had promised earlier that she would make him pot roast, he is sitting at the table asking where the pot roast is. And she's like, well, it's really late, so I'll make pot roast tomorrow. And he says, no, you're gonna make me pot roast right now. And he sits there like a little baby waiting for his pot roast to be made. I understand being a little upset that suddenly Brie is really busy and doesn't have any time for you, but like, you're her partner. Support her journey. Support her journey. And you can cook that damn pot roast yourself. Sorry, I was watching Twin Peaks content. Anyway, season five, episode three. I have a full five lines of notes for this episode, <laughs> which we will talk about shortly. Catherine and Mrs. McCluskey have begun working together to try and find out more about Dave. His full name is Dave Williams, um, and there is just no information about this man online, so he's either lying about his name or something weird is going on because he feels the need to cover up his past. Speaking of Dave, the boys of Wisteria Lane start a band. Um, this is something Tom is very excited about because he's having that midlife crisis, so the band is called Blue Odyssey, and the members are as follows. We have Mike Delfino on guitar, Carlos Solis on the tambourine, Orson Hodge on keyboard, Tom Scabo on bass guitar, and Dave Williams on the drums. <laughs> it's kind of cute. I love this. It says, <laughs> the last part of the Wikipedia page for it just says, the band has apparently broken up since then. <laughs> I don't know. I just stream them on Spotify. The band is a great way to get all the men together and especially for Dave to bond with each of the men on the lane, but one man in particular, it seems, because he is growing closer to Tom than he is to the other guys in the band. So is Tom the one who he's after? I don't know. Mrs. McCluskey is growing increasingly paranoid about Dave and it's become obvious to Dave as she and Catherine investigate that she is suspicious. So he decides to take precaution and tells Edie that he thinks Mrs. McCluskey is becoming senile. This way, if she makes any sort of weird accusations, then he already has the groundwork there to blame her getting old and senile. So episode three is pretty focused on building the mystery around who Dave is and why he's really on the lane. Season five, episode four. Lynette helps Brie with some copy for the advertising for her cookbook. Um, Brie doesn't really like any of the ideas though, but it's still pretty clear that Brie does think Lynette is very good at her job and she kind of gives her 
a push to get back into the field. Turns out that Lynette's old assistant, Stu, who we met and knew briefly in season two, now owns his own marketing firm. So Lynette comes to realize that she has fallen behind in her career. For Susan and Mike in this episode, the new relationship between MJ and Jackson has come to provide a little bit of tension between Susan and Mike. This happens when MJ paints a family portrait for school and he paints Mike as really, really tiny. This makes Mike really insecure because he's working really long hours. He also no longer lives on Mysteria Lane. So to come and see MJ every day is more difficult than it is for Jackson to come see MJ when he sees Susan every day. Mike gets MJ a new bike and promises that he will teach him how to ride it, but Jackson teaches him how to ride it instead. So when Mike shows up to teach MJ how to ride the bike, she tells MJ to fall off the bike on purpose. He just like comes still and tips right over. They have to take him to the emergency room because he hurt his arm when he fell. And this is when Mike decides that he is going to move back onto Wisteria Lane so he can be more involved in MJ's life. Edie begins to question whether or not Wisteria Lane is the right place for her and Dave to be living. But Dave snaps at her, stating that he wants to stay on the lane. It's become very clear that staying on Wisteria Lane has been very important to him and part of his overall scheming with Edie. They end up buying another house on Wisteria Lane as an investment and it ends up being rented out to Mike. For Brie in this episode, there's a few moving parts between her and Orson. So Orson can't hold down a job because of his criminal record. Orson feels like he's been pushed out by Brie and he would really like to be a bigger part of the company. Brie, on the other hand, doesn't feel very successful despite her company being huge and making plenty of money. She says, Quote, everything I gain comes at some horrible price. Uh, she fears that now she's going to lose Orson because of the company. Lynette tells her that all of Bree's friends are so proud of her, and Bree officially gives Orson a job in the company, but she doesn't consult Catherine about this first. She just makes him partner, which is kind of Catherine's job. It seems that Bree owns the company fully, and then Catherine is like, a partner, but then she makes Orson the partner instead and Catherine just an employee. She just can't afford to lose Orson, so she has to do what she's got to do to make him stay, and that means giving him a partner in the company. Season 5, episode 5. This episode is the first of many fuck Tom Scavos that I must exclaim over the next coming seasons. Up until this point, I have been incredibly patient with Tom Scavo and very generous about where I draw the line between just a fun little subplot and him making my blood boil. In this episode, we see a flashback to what really kicked off Tom's midlife crisis or second midlife crisis, I should say. He was doing a repair job at the restaurant and he was electrocuted and almost died. When he and Lynette have a disagreement about how he wants to do something new with his life. He pulls out his bracelet from the hospital and says that he keeps it to remind him of what he went through and remind him of the time he almost died and how he has to really take every moment for what it's worth. Because him almost dying is just the most dramatic thing that's ever happened to him. Lynette was shot and she had cancer. In the present day, he tells Lynette he wants to take the family on a new adventure. He wants to put them in an RV and travel across the country for a year. And then he tells her that he has sold the pizzeria. He did not discuss this with her. He just sold it. She says to him, Scavo's was the adventure. I mean, it was this whole epiphany he had five years ago that like, having a pizza parlor was what he wanted to do. You know, him getting restless, him feeling these things, okay, you're allowed to feel things and be frustrated. But for him to sell the restaurant out from under him and his wife's feet, huh? Fuck Tom Scavo, okay. Next, we get a Susan flashback. She and Mike are signing divorce papers, and Susan is having some second thoughts and having a really hard time doing so. In the present day, Jackson tells Susan he wants more than the casual relationship that they have had, implying he wants to get very serious, maybe move in, maybe marry her, 
We continue with the Brie Orson Catherine power struggle with the company in this episode. Brie is now more in tune with Catherine's feelings and how hurt Catherine is that she made Orson partner. Brie doesn't know exactly what to do yet, but she knows that she needs to make things right with Catherine. We get a brief flashback that shows when Orson is in prison, Brie had a relapse with her alcoholism. She is drinking and she's sitting there like in her bathrobe sobbing and Catherine is there for her and she tells Brie that she's going to move in to help her through this rough period. Here's some line of dialogue. So Brie says, my husband's gone, my son's gone, I have nothing left. I don't know if I can make it this time. And Catherine says, yes, you will because I'm moving in. They're so pooky. <laughs> Back in the present day, Brie tells Orson that he is fired. Orson tells Brie that he wants a divorce. He feels that her taking the job away after everything they've been through is unfair and he doesn't understand why Brie is putting Catherine's needs over his. And she explains that she relapsed and Catherine was there for her, so she owes her a lot. She lost her husband, her son, her sobriety, but Catherine was there for her, no questions asked. So her loyalty lies with Catherine. Orson stops by Catherine's and thanks her for what she did to help Brie, and he agrees that he will simply work for the company and only become partner when Catherine also agrees to it. So this makes Brie and Orson make up. Elsewhere on Wisteria Lane, we celebrate Mrs. McCluskey's 70th birthday party with a big birthday dinner. The party for McCluskey is Dave's idea, and while McCluskey is at the party, meaning her house is abandoned, Dave breaks into McCluskey's home and messes around with her stuff. He just subtly moves a few things around so she will feel like she has lost her mind. Basically what happens in the film Gaslight, if you've seen that movie, when McCluskey gets home, she immediately realizes things are off and she blames Dave right away because he's been the only really suspicious one in the neighborhood this season. So she goes back over with a bat and ends up hitting her own birthday cake. They have to call 911 for Karen because she has gotten really worked up about this situation and, and Dave is the one to join her on the ambulance. She says to Dave, you planned the whole thing, you're trying to get rid of me because Dave has begun suggesting that she is so senile and can't take care of herself and is maybe dangerous to others. So perhaps she needs to go into a nursing home. This is when Dave confirms, yes, he did indeed plan the whole thing. And we get a voiceover line from Mary Alice saying that it wouldn't be long before Dave destroyed the man who ruined his life. So far, all he's done is fuck with Mrs. McCluskey, but he's got some deeper plans. Season five, episode six. So Carlos is working as a masseuse, right? He has this client who is an older woman named Virginia. And he gave her an orgasm while he was massaging her. Now, he did not touch her in that way. It just happened. So she grows very fond of Carlos. We have some drama in the Scavo household to report. Tom begins working with this woman named Anne Schilling to find a rehearsal space for the band. This is Anne right here. He starts spending all this time at the rehearsal space for the band. It seems like it's become this little bachelor pad for him. So she goes to the place late at night to check it out. He's just chilling there watching like a football game. But she explains that she was really anxious that he was having an affair because first she sees him not sneaking around, but she doesn't know about it. So it seems like he's sneaking around with this woman Anne, and now he's spending all this time at a secondary location that happens to have like a futon or whatever. He tells her that he will come home, but on the floor, he moves his foot to put it on top of a condom wrapper so that he can hide this evidence from Lynette. Is he having an affair? Was it more than just finding this rental space with this woman, Anne? I don't know. Turns out, this is the first Thomas scene of this condom, and he discovers that it is actually Porter who is sleeping with Anne. Yes, Porter Scavo, his son, who is 16 or 17, is sleeping with Anne. So here is Count four or five of statutory rape on the show. Because Tom is kind of concerned about who was having sex in the bachelor pad, Tom goes to the bachelor pad to kind of scope out what is going on there. And he discovers that it is indeed Porter who is sleeping with Anne. But Lynette has not given up on following Tom around. So she just sees Anne leaving, clearly having just been laid. And she assumes that Tom lied to her. So Lynette goes home and packs a bag to prepare to leave Tom. 
Because if you'll recall, in season one, she said to Tom, if you ever cheat on me, I will take the kids and be out of here. Over in Susanville, um, she is not quite ready to fully commit to Jackson yet and make it as serious as he wants. So when she goes over to his apartment to talk to him, he is there with another woman in the shower. So that's how that relationship's going. Catherine is thinking about moving to Maryland to be closer to her daughter, Dylan. And she just feels like she's not really needed anymore in Fairview. But Brie tells Catherine that she cares about her very deeply, implying that she really wants her to stay. And finally, Mrs. McCluskey is out of the hospital after the incident at her birthday party, and she decides to call in some backup support. So she makes a phone call to her sister, Roberta, who shows up to, one, help take care of her on her transition out of the hospital, and two, figure out what the fuck is going on with Dave. Roberta is played by the one and only Lily Tomlin. I... I'm thrilled to finally have Lily Tomlin on this wall. It's an honor, truly. Like, there she is in her little hat. Oh, my God. I fucking love Roberta, first of all. She is probably one of my favorite characters who appears for, like, a handful of episodes. Her and Nora. God bless. Season 5, Episode 7. Virginia has been really relying on Carlos to help manage her pain. She offers to Carlos to hire him more permanently to be a personal masseuse for her as opposed to working at the club where he works. Things quickly start to get a little creepy. She gets really attached to Celia and Juanita. Something is just a little weird. So Gabby tries to set a strict boundary with her. Once Gabby tells Virginia that her family is not for sale, Virginia decides to tell the club that Carlos touched her inappropriately so that he loses his job. Porter has been caught by Tom and Lynette for his affair with and chilling, and he agrees to end it as long as his parents don't tell Anne's son, Kirby, who is one of Porter's friends from school, about the affair. And then when Lynette sees Anne chilling at a public restroom, she corners her and scolds her for sleeping with an underage boy, to which Anne responds, I love Porter, and Lynette says, so do I. This scene is great for a couple reasons. One, Lynette's mama bear side really comes out. Two, we get a connection between Lynette and Porter that we missed earlier in the season when Lynette tried to connect with him, but was like, I'm a high schooler, lol. And so this, although they're not bonding, it's still clear how much Lynette cares about her kids and how far she's willing to go to protect them. And that's a theme that becomes important later on in the season. Lastly, it shows us just how deep in Porter is with this woman. If she is saying that she loves Porter to his mother, we can only imagine what she has said to him. Anne ends up telling Porter that she is pregnant and we see Porter apparently giving her some money. Meanwhile, Brie and Orson have to fire a kid who was caught stealing from their business. In order to protect himself, this teenager steals the surveillance tape from that night in order to get rid of the evidence that he was stealing. It turns out that this surveillance tape also has footage from the night before when Brie and Orson made love on the counter in the test kitchen. We haven't really talked about the test kitchen at all. It appears that during the time jump, Brie converted her garage into a kitchen. And then um, there's stairs up to the second level of the garage that has become an office space. After some struggling, Andrew manages to get the surveillance tape. And it turns out it is not Brie and Orson on the tape. It is Catherine and Mike. That's right. Catherine Mayfair and Mike Delfino have begun hooking up. Brie, it seems, is the first to find out. Thanks to all of Roberta's digging, Karen discovers that Dave is criminally insane. But unfortunately, that is where the women hit a dead end with the Williams investigation. Season 5, Episode 8. We start off at a bar, um, and it is a battle of the bands. One of the bands performing is Blue Odyssey, which is the Visteria Lane boy band. There is a fire at the bar, and someone is taken into custody. Like, all of a sudden, we are in Jennifer's body or something? And this is the cold open. Afterwards, we cut back to the beginning of the week. Virginia has come back, and she has made Gabby and Carlos the sole heirs in her will. All the other water is under the bridge. She got Carlos's job back. Seems like things will be okay. And now they are entitled to a ton of money if Virginia were to pass. And keep in mind that the Solis family is really struggling with money right now. Gabby was even seen shopping at Walmart, buying single ply toilet paper. 
Over in the Scavo household, Preston tells Lynette that Porter got Anne pregnant. Lynette goes over to talk to Anne about the situation. Anne is married to a man named Warren. Um, he is a little blue figure represented here. He does not know that she is being unfaithful to him. But when Lynette goes and confronts Anne about the pregnancy, Warren overhears. He loses his temper and we see right away that he is an abusive man. Lynette initially leaves the home, but then she hears Anne yelling for help. So she runs back inside to help her. Warren has beat her up pretty bad and Lynette sticks around to help her and get her some medical treatment. In Susanville, Julie comes home with a boyfriend who is a man who is much older than her and also a professor of hers. He's planning to propose to her. Um, Susan tells Julie that he is planning to propose and Julie tells Susan that she is not planning on getting married ever because she saw what a mess her mom's divorce was and how much it completely ruined Susan and she has no plans of ever going through that. And it's not only her marriage to Carl that she watched fall apart and then had to raise Susan after, but also Susan's marriage to Mike. So Julie just thinks that getting married is no longer worth it. She's just gonna screw around with the guy she wants to screw around with and that's that. Dave missed an important checkup slash follow-up appointment with his doctor. The doctor is the man pictured here in this dark image that you can barely see. Anyways, <laughs> so the doctor goes to Fairview to look for Dave, check in on him, see what's going on, and Dave informs the doctor that he is safe in Fairview, despite the doctor's concern that Fairview is not a healthy place for him to be. He informs his doctor that Edie knows all about what happened here and that she's been very supportive and making sure that he stays safe and healthy and doesn't harm himself or anyone. And that is a gosh darn lie. Edie doesn't know anything about it any of this situation. The audience barely knows about it. Pretty much the only people who do at this moment are Dave and his doctor and it's kind of Roberta and McCluskey. They know that at least he was a patient that he saw this doctor. They're able to put those pieces together. All right, now we are on the Battle of the Bands night. Dave's doctor goes to the Battle of the Bands. His doctor is concerned when he discovers that Mike Delfino is a part of the band. This reveals a crucial piece of information to the audience. Dave is there because of Mike Delfino. Still at the bar, Dave takes Dr. Heller into a back room, kills him, and then starts a fire. When he emerges from this storage room in the back where the fire has started, he sees Jackson stepping into the bathroom. This is very bad for Dave because it puts him at the scene of the crime, according to Jackson's eyewitness account. So he locks the bathroom from the outside, planning to trap Jackson in there and take him out along with the fire. Porter comes into the bar and attacks Warren, Anne's husband, who owns the bar. They fight. He and Lynette get thrown out of the bar. And then Warren tells a bartender to lock the door. So the man goes over and locks the door, which prevents anyone from leaving or coming in through the back door. When the hit Wisteria Lane boy band Blue Odyssey takes the stage, the fire begins to spread. The whole place bursts into flames and it becomes disastrous as people desperately try to escape. The back door is locked, meaning everyone has to squeeze out through the front door. People are being shoved and trampled and it's a very dangerous situation. Virginia has come to the Battle of the Bands Night to support Carlos and Gabby runs back inside to save her because she is not able to get out on her own. This is pretty remarkable of Gabby because it would be really easy for her, but also for the writers, to decide to make Gabby let her die in order for the two of them to receive her money. But the decision to make Gabby do something selfless here is really nice and it shows that she is growing as a person. So shout out to Gabby for that. Susan realizes that Jackson is nowhere to be seen while the bar is burning down in front of them. So Mike runs inside to try and find Jackson to save his life. Jackson manages to escape out the bathroom window, but Mike doesn't know this yet. So he runs in trying to find him and he ends up passing out in the smoke. Susan is freaking out outside. So Dave runs in to save Mike because he cannot let Mike die. He needs to take care of him himself. He's not done with his plans for Mike. Mike cannot die yet. Season five, episode nine. Carlos is injured in the fire. When they go and see a doctor, they have to do different scans and an x-ray, MRI, all that stuff. 
The doctor is able to see in one of Carlos's scans that there is a tiny bone fragment putting pressure on Carlos's optical nerve. And he suggests that maybe if he were to perform surgery and remove the bone fragment, Carlos might get his sight back. Meanwhile, Tom and Lynette are beginning to worry that maybe Porter set the fire at the bar. It would not be the first time the twins committed arson. And also because Warren had just thrown him out, they got into a physical fight. Lynette declares to Tom, however, that if Porter did set the fire, they are going to do everything they can to protect him. The theory that Porter set the fire that night doesn't really make sense though. He was thrown out the back door, so he couldn't come back in that way. He would have had to go all the way around through the front door and then make it into the back hallway without anyone seen him. And so far, no one had spotted him. So it just doesn't quite seem likely that that would have been possible. Lynette offers money to Anne Schilling to leave town and leave Porter alone. She's just trying to simplify the mess however she can. Anne tells Lynette that there is no baby and there never was any baby. So she was just manipulating Porter with this news, but she does end up taking the money. Porter makes a promise to Lynette that he did not start the fire that night. It's so reminiscent of last season when Tom is promising that he didn't set the fire. Last season, it mattered to Lynette whether Tom set the fire or not. But this season, when it's Porter who is risking prison time and being charged with a crime, I don't think it really matters to her whether he did or not. She's going to protect him the same way either way. Like I said, the theory that Porter set the fire doesn't really make too much sense because no one saw him. Well, Dave reports to the police that he saw Porter enter the back room shortly before the fire started. Speaking of Dave, in return for saving his life, Dave gets Mike to promise him that the two of them will remain good friends. That's the only thanks he needs is Mike's friendship. Catherine stops by to see Mike and explains that she doesn't want Susan to know about the two of them yet. Mike does, however, tell Susan that he is seeing someone and it's someone Susan knows, but they're not ready to tell her yet. So Susan stops by to talk to Catherine to bitch about one of her friends seeing Mike. Now, I don't know how many friends Susan has, but like most of them are married. So I don't know how she doesn't put this one together on her own, but that's okay, Susan. Anyway, it's here that she discovers that Catherine is the one seeing Mike. Susan also finds out that Brie already knows about Mike and Catherine, which is very upsetting to her because she expected a true friend to tell her if a friend was seeing her ex-husband. Brie doesn't think that Susan is being very rational about this whole thing and suggests that either she tells Mike how she feels or she let it go and try to move on because clearly that is what Mike is trying to do. So Susan is kind of at a crossroads with her relationship. And finally, following the incident, Orson develops a snoring problem, so he gets surgery done. And when we see the doctor's desk, there is a framed photograph of him and Andrew, meaning this doctor who Brie has just met is Andrew's boyfriend. Season five, episode 10. Carlos can see some shapes after his surgery. This is a great sign that he might regain full sight again. There are a few things that Gabby is very worried about though. She fears that Carlos may not like the way she looks anymore because she's old and not attractive anymore. Mind you, Eva Longoria is like what, like 30? Gabby is certainly not as dialed up in this season as she has been in past seasons, but like, it's just, she has a bob. What are you trying to say? <laughs> My roommate and I just sat there like laughing every single time that Gabby or someone else insinuates that Gabby has like lost her good looks <laughs> because what show are you watching? Um, she also dresses in like sweatpants and stuff. So God forbid her husband see her. Anyways, the other thing she's worried about is the money situation. The family has had to go through a lot of really tough times. So Gabby has had to sell a lot of their valuables. One such valuable is Carlos's beloved Lou Gehrig signed baseball. Now he finds out that she sold it and he demands that she go get it back. So she has to go through all these hoops to get this baseball back. But then at the end of the episode, Carlos goes upstairs and into their closet and he sees that all of Gabby's fancy designer clothes and designer shoes that she used to treasure are gone. Her closet is very basic now. She sold all of her valuables. Carlos ends up selling the baseball again and buying Gabby a nice dress and pair of shoes to thank her and show his appreciation for everything that she sacrificed for him. 
Following the testimony from Dave, Porter is arrested. His bail is set at $20,000. And because the Scavo family just gave pretty much all of their savings to Ann Schilling to get her to leave town, um, it takes a lot of scrambling and putting their restaurant on the line. I believe the restaurant is still theirs, despite Tom selling it. I think Lynette put a stop to that for now, but I don't fucking know what's happening in season five, okay? Like, I took very detailed notes of this show, and there's just so much shit going on that I don't know what's good. What? what? Warren Schilling threatens Porter when he's out on bail because of the affair. He threatens basically to kill him. So Porter goes into hiding, and Preston appears in court in his place. In this episode, MJ begins to deal with the new budding relationship between Mike and Catherine. He doesn't want to go to the zoo with the two of them first. And then Susan says of Catherine, she should be on the cover of Menopause Monthly. Where do I get a subscription? Sign me up. MJ sees his parents holding hands at a bowling alley, and he decides to drop his bowling ball on Catherine's foot. At the doctor's office, Brie finally notices the picture of Andrew and the doctor. So she invites him over for dinner with Andrew the following night. Brie has Andrew and his boyfriend Alex over for dinner, as well as Bob and Lee. Because she's got to bring all the gays she knows together for this special event, of course. Lee seems to know Alex, but he can't quite put a finger on where. And then Bob and Lee realize, and they tell Brie that they saw Alex in an adult film. Marie thinks it's this huge scandal, really big deal, huge secret that Alex has been keeping from Andrew. So she goes to Andrew. She's like, did you know that your boyfriend was in an adult film? And he's like, yeah, I know. He told me it's okay. I'm not going to judge him. Don't judge him because I love him. And Brie's like, okay. And lastly, Dave begins having visions of his wife and daughter who are none other than Paige and Lila Dash we also begins having visions of this episode. That means I finally feel comfortable putting up the tombstone over their image. So excuse me while I do that. I'm also going to put up tombstone on Dr. Heller. And there we go. Okay, beautiful. Season five, episode 11. Gabby finds a new job for Carlos, but it sounds awful. So he turns it down. After a lot of thought, Carlos agrees to take the job because Gabby has already done so much and sacrificed so much for their family. So taking this job so that he can provide for them again is the least that he can do. Porter is still missing in action following his arraignment and Preston is not willing to give him up because Warren's threat really scared Porter and therefore really scared Preston as well. He's very protective of his brother. We love to see it. Lynette has this monologue in this episode while she's driving, I think it's Porter, around. She promises that if Warren were to ever come near either of the twins, she would not let it slide and she would do what she has to do. Porter is ultimately revealed to be hiding with Lynette's mom in her condo. We have not seen her since last season, so welcome back. Facing uncertainties about her decision between Mike and Jackson, Susan goes to Lee to seek out some romance advice, and he tells her that she should not move in with Jackson until she's sure she's ready. Speaking of moving in with people, Andrew and his boyfriend have dinner with Bree. Um, that all goes well. Bree and Andrew and Alex are all getting along pretty well, but then Alex's mother comes into town, and she is already inserting herself a lot into their relationship and talking about where the boys will spend Christmas, and which holidays Brie will get them for, that kind of stuff. So in a, a panic, one might say, Brie decides to buy Andrew a house on Wisteria Lane. So Andrew and Alex end up living on the lane together in a house that Brie bought for them. Dave is really not doing well. He continues to have these visions of Lila and Paige, and he is speaking to them, but he refuses to tell Edie who he's talking to, and it's starting to freak her out a little bit. She's realizing that something is just not quite right. When she confronts him about who he's talking to, he completely snaps at her. Edie tells Dave that if he's not willing to be honest with her, then their marriage is going to fall apart. He finally tells Edie that he was married before, and she says that she wants him out by that night. Dave betraying her by keeping something so major from her is just not gonna cut it with her. Finally, Mrs. McCluskey and Roberta go to talk to Dr. Heller about Dave. 
But Dr. Heller is not in his office. In fact, he went to Fairview and has not been seen since. We, the audience, know Dr. Heller is dead, having been murdered right before the fire at the bar. But now Karen and Roberta are really beginning to close in on him. Season 5, episode 12. Porter's case is dismissed for lack of evidence. Bob was his lawyer on the case and he really pulled through for Porter, so shout out to Bob. Catherine, still unsure if she's even wanted around here, asks Mike if she should stay or if she should move to Maryland to be with her daughter. And Mike doesn't really give a fuck. He's like, well, do what you have to do. That's okay. Since Dave was told to leave by Edie, Dave moves in with Mike, who has his own place. It was Mike's offer. And because they're pretty good friends, it seems to make sense. And they get to bond a lot. This is when Mike tells Dave that he thinks he is falling in love with Catherine. So he does want her to stay. Okay, speak up. This episode has what is, for me, my favorite Susan and Edie scene of the entire series. It occurs when they are locked in a basement together. It's a little reminiscent in that way of Edie and Gabby's scene uh, during the tornado episode. Susan opens up to her a little bit about being upset about Mike. Um, it's kind of a natural conversation since Edie has just ended her own marriage. You know, they're, they're going to talk about the state of their relationships. And Edie asks Susan, when was the last time she was without a man? And Susan can't really remember. She's always jumped from man to man. It was Carlos and then Mike right away and then Ian and then Mike and then Jackson. Like she's always been, oh, there was also a doctor in there. But anyways, Susan's always had a boyfriend. She's never been able to just be on her own. And Edie tells Susan, I go after men because I want them. You go after men because you need them. And then Susan tells Edie that she only needs them because of the way that her father was. And so Edie slaps her. She says, bitch, I have no daddy issues. What are you talking about? It's a great scene. And I'm really glad that somebody finally speaks the truth to Susan um, because somebody had to say it. It's because I want Susan to be the best Susan she can be that I care. And she does not need to have one boyfriend at the, after the other. We have now reached the midpoint of the season. Season five is pretty interesting because the overarching mystery of the season is pretty thin, to be honest. They pace it pretty well. So first, we don't know who Dave is after. And then we learn that like he really is dangerous and he's after Mike. We're slowly putting these pieces together about how far he's willing to go, who he's willing to lie to, how he's willing to manipulate people. But we don't know this man. I don't think I could say I'm that invested in his marriage with Edie, so even that tie is just pretty weak. Um, I'm really glad they brought Edie back though, like don't get me wrong. The mysteries and the way that they involve the other characters have just been a little thin lately. In season three, we had some pretty good tie-ins because with this whole thing, it was very strongly tied to Brie, who just has such a presence on the show. But we also had that connection to Mike with the whole Monique Pollier thing. And then eventually this became involved in the Scavo storyline. So all the parts kind of blended together, um, at least for a good handful of episodes. Whereas in season five, we're just kind of seeing Little's plots all being put together to fill the whole 43 minutes. I don't have anything against filler episodes, but filler seasons. Anyway, on to season five, episode 13. This is the 100th episode of Desperate Housewives, and they did something a little special. This is a standalone episode in which a beloved handyman who would always do work around the neighborhood has passed away, and everyone comes together to honor his memory. We get little glimpses throughout the episode of the ways that he helped the different women over the years. And although we have never seen this character before, it's still a pretty heartwarming episode that, at its core, really inspires viewers to consider the people who have even the smallest impact on their lives and to always be kind to people and help them out. Season 5, episode 14. Carlos and Gabby are rich again because he has this big new job, but everyone else is kind of broke because the economy. Um, keep in mind, this was 2008, 2009. However, there was a five-year time jump. So, so the way that all these characters start talking about the recession, it feels like it's supposed to be a little earlier than it is because of the time jump. Um, it, it should just be set in the current day, but whatever, that's okay. 
Tom sells his car that he bought because of the midlife crisis, and Susan cannot afford MJ's tuition at a new private school. She is upset because Mike also can't contribute enough to get MJ to go to the school. However, he buys Catherine a new set of pearls. Susan breaks into Catherine's home to try and get the pearls back. She plans to take them back so she can get the money back so that MJ can go to private school. This means that Mike is forced to admit that the pearls were fake, but Catherine really doesn't mind. She's not like, she didn't expect a necklace full of real pearls. It was a very thoughtful gift from Mike. Bree ends up loaning Lynette some money and she tells her just to consider it an investment in the pizza parlor and that leads to them having some disagreements some some tension in their friendship susan ends up getting a job at mj school she becomes the assistant to the art teacher and this enables her to pay for mj's private school education finally for dave and edie dave tells edie that he knows their relationship won't last forever he never really meant it to when he married her and said he'll love her forever he meant not forever. Also, Tom finds out that it was Dave who told the cops that Porter set the fire that night, so he goes over and punches Dave in the face. Season 5, episode 15. Carlos's boss informs him that employees will not be getting a bonus this year, but then Gabby finds out that the boss has a mistress, and so she blackmails him so that Carlos gets a bonus after all. The mistress, Shayla, is played by Megan Hilty. I was thrilled about this when I was 14 years old, and I am thrilled about it now. She does so great in her little role on Desperate Housewives. Maybe not as good as her role on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, but that's one of the greatest television guest star performances of all time. For the Scavos, Tom has to let go of all of the waitstaff at the pizzeria because he can't afford it anymore. I don't know why none of this was considered three months ago when he was telling his wife he was about to sell the pizzeria, but for some reason, it's now a problem. So now it's just gonna be him and the kids working at the pizzeria. We have more Susan drama this episode. Because of her new work schedule, she's having a hard time with childcare, and Mike isn't always around to babysit MJ, and so Catherine so graciously offers to watch MJ free of charge whenever Susan needs so that Susan can get situated in her new job and not have to worry about finding a sitter. There's one occasion where Mike is watching MJ, but then there is a plumbing emergency. So he has to go and he leaves MJ with Catherine and Susan gets all pissy about it. Like if you have a problem with this, I don't know, maybe take it up with Mike. The thing that drives me crazy about this is it's one thing if she never met this woman, you know? But this is one of her oldest friends and she won't let her friend take care of her son just because her friend is now dating her ex. I don't know, Susan, get it together, girl. At one point, Catherine tells MJ that Mike will be moving in with her soon. It's presumably to save money so that he can support MJ. If he's saving money on rent, that's more money he can contribute to MJ and his education, college fund, things like that. In this episode, we see that Dave has a gun he presumably plans to use on Mike. Andrew, who has been working for Brie, gets a big raise, but she will not tell Orson how much of a raise she gave Andrew. And then, as he's processing the complex emotions he's feeling about Andrew getting a raise, Orson steals Andrew's fancy pen. This is the beginning of what is perhaps Orson's second worst arc in the entire series. Season 5, episode 16. Gabby and Carlos continue to struggle to hide their boss's affair. Gabby confronts Shayla, the mistress, about the whole affair and blames her for being a homewrecker. That upsets the boss, and he tells Gabby that Carlos is fired. But then, the wife finds out about the affair. She kills her husband and then calls Gabby and Carlos to have them come over to help her figure out what to do. All this is to say, Carlos gets a promotion because his boss is dead. All right, on to the scabos. I have in my notes that Lynette's hair is looking better and she wears a beautiful dress. OMG, heart, 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 heart. Um, because for some reason, they started dressing Lynette in terrible clothing this season. Like these sundresses that don't fit her and they gave her a really weird haircut. I don't really know what was going on. They're kind of dressing her the way that like Susan used to dress. Um, and now Susan is gradually starting to dress a little better. And I don't know if she just gave all of her clothes to Lynette or what. Tom is being really stubborn as he tries to find another job now that the pizzeria is closing. Um, but he and Lynette 
completely blow a job interview that they have with someone. And Tom decides that he would be okay with Lynette going back to work instead. Dave runs into his old pastor while he is at the grocery store shopping for wine with Edie. The pastor is very surprised that Dave moved back into town. So Edie is slowly picking up clues from other people and from Dave that something is very off. Even though she's trying to repair her marriage from this distance she has created, there is something she's missing. Through the pastor, Edie discovers that Dave's real last name is David Dash. Now, the audience could already put this together themselves because we knew that Lila and Paige's last name was Dash, but this is the first time, of course, Edie discovers it or any character on the lane for that matter. Mike officially moves in with Catherine and she hosts a housewarming party. He brings a new painting with him and during the party she finds out that Susan actually painted it so she hides the painting. Finally for this episode we do see Tom packing up the pizza parlor. They are going to have to sell it. Orson stops by to see if he needs any help with anything and while he is there he steals a pepper shaker. Bree suggests that Tom work for her publisher since they're looking at doing all the advertising in-house. And this is a little weird because like four months ago, she didn't like any of the work that Lynette did for her. Um, but that's okay. Maybe Tom will be different. So they have a dinner um, and this is the interview where Lynette and Tom completely blow it. Orson then steals the publisher's tape recorder. Season five, episode 17. Carlos starts his new job. Lynette asks Gabby if there's any way that Carlos might be able to find a job for her now that he has joined this new company. But Gabby tells her she doesn't really want to get involved in that way. However, as she becomes more threatened by the presence of another woman working with Carlos, she decides that maybe Carlos should hire Lynette so that she can keep an eye on Lucy and Carlos for her. So Lynette ends up getting this awesome job under Carlos. Edie finds the obituary for Paige and Lila Dash, and this is the first she hears about Dave having a daughter. Now, about that gun of Dave's. It seems like he plans to use it on this camping trip he's planning to go on with Mike. Catherine realizes she can't go on the camping trip though, so she lets the boys know, and Dave goes over and tells her how important it is that she comes on this trip. So we as the audience are able to put together that it's not Mike, who he plans to use this gun on, it's Catherine. All Dave wants is to hurt Mike, and killing him isn't going to do that. He needs to take away someone he loves. And Mike had just shared with Dave that he's falling in love with Catherine. Orson's kleptomania continues to get worse. Bree hosts an intervention for him. She returns all the knickknacks from the neighbors. Then Orson starts to steal again. He insists he's not stealing, but... She takes a mug from him and is like, you own a mug of Bernadette Peters in Gypsy? Clearly from Bob and Lee. Yeah, this kleptomania arc is so bizarre, but it's part of the truth of season five. And I trust all of you to be brave enough to handle the truth. Season five, episode 18. We finally have a jam-packed episode. Let's start with Gabby and Lynette. Lucy needs Lynette and Carlos to work super late and a lot of overtime. Um, on a specific project, and Gabby begins to fear that Carlos is going to fall right back into his old ways. Back in season one, he was working all the time, never made any time for her. She always came last to his work, and now that he has this job, which she asked him to take, she's realizing that maybe she made a mistake and has put them back where they started. She decides to tell him how she feels, and the next day, an incident happens in the office and he ends up firing Lucy because he decides he wants to create a workplace that really values the people who work there. So we see that Carlos has grown in some ways. Back in season four, Carl was remarried and his new wife was in Susan's Lamaze class with her. Well, now his kid is in Susan's art class. They have a chance to chat and catch up a little bit and Carl reveals to Susan that his wife left him and now he understands the pain that he put Susan through when he left her. In therapy, Orson reveals that he steals in order to hurt Bree. He feels like he's really lost control in his marriage, he's not valued, blah 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 blah. So Bree is considering selling her company in order to save her marriage. Andrew urges her not to do this. He doesn't want Bree to give anything up just to make a husband happy. 
And she explains she feels like she would be a hypocrite if she didn't sacrifice something in order to save her marriage, especially after Orson went to jail in order to win Bree back. Bree discusses this possible sale with Orson, but at the end of the day decides not to sell the company. And Orson warns her that he may start stealing again, and Bree says, well, you won't steal my company. Now on to the camping trip. Dave and Catherine have a nice discussion about his grief. He doesn't give her all the details in his life. He just explains that something really bad happened and he's been grieving and it's been up to him to take his life back into his own hands and address his grief. Meanwhile, on Wisteria Lane, Edie tells McCluskey about Dave having a child. McCluskey feels a little bit bad for him because she also lost a child and she really wishes that Dave had told both of them sooner. Edie continues to look into Dave's history. She gets a fax that confirms the car accident that killed Paige and Lila Dash was the car accident that Mike Delfino was responsible for. At this very moment, Mike and Catherine are out on a hike with Dave. Edie calls Dave right away, fearing that Mike might be in danger. She has good instincts because Dave has his rifle pointed at Catherine from within the trees. His cell phone ringing causes him to fire and miss. Catherine and Mike are freaked out that somebody is hunting in this little state park, so they leave. Edie texts Dave telling him that she knows everything and that he needs to come home. So he goes home. Edie confronts Dave and asks, did you move us here to hurt Mike Delfino? She is devastated to learn that Dave never really loved her and it was all just part of a sick plan. She says we could have been so happy and Dave begins to choke her. He almost chokes her to death and she runs out of the house crying. At this very moment, Orson, who has been stealing once again, runs out onto the street, forcing Edie to swerve. Forcing Edie to swerve. Her car runs into a pole and we're like, oh my god. But then Edie steps out of the car into a puddle of water and then she is electrocuted by loose wires from the pole that she hit and collapses. Season 5 episode 19 picks off right where we left off and this time the voiceover instead of Mary Alice comes from Edie Britt. All my neighbors heard it happen, she says. We watch all the neighbors run outside to Edie's side, wonder what the hell happened. Everyone is watching over Edie. The good news? I died just like I lived, as the complete and utter center of attention. Okay, hold on. This one really hurts. This episode is a tribute to Edie, and it shows us a bunch of times when she did important things in the women's lives. Um, they are all clips that we've never seen before, which is pretty typical for a Desperate Housewives clip show. The flashback scenes are pretty good, and then the rest of the episode is the girls driving to give Travers, who is Edie's son, his mother's ashes. The moments where they're in the car are so <laughs> awful. They're so awful. I don't know what happened with this dialogue, but it's a hot mess. Um, but the flashback scenes are good. So um, Travers doesn't want the ashes, however, but I think he's glad that they at least went and told him in person. Um, so the women decide to split up the ashes and they dump them in their own yards on Wisteria Lane. Season 5, episode 20. The very first thing in my notes is, why are they dressing Lynette so bad this season? So I guess my compliment from, you know, two episodes ago was not very long lived. Catherine tells Mike that he is the man she plans to marry and spend the rest of her life with, to which he responds. The girls have Mike check on Dave, who is not doing very well in the aftermath of Edie's death. Susan stops by later to check on Dave herself and discovers that he has a gun. She begins to worry that he's planning to use this gun on himself, and so she takes his gun, all his knives and belts, and other potentially dangerous objects, 
so that he cannot harm himself. Dave opens up to Susan a little bit and explains that he is struggling because he blames himself for what happened to Edie. Susan follows suit and being just as vulnerable, decides to open up about some similar guilt that she carries, which is the night that she was in a car accident with Mike, which killed a mother and her child, it was actually her driving the car and not Mike. Mike took the blame, however, because she didn't have her license on her at the time. This is when we see a major shift in Dave, and he is no longer going after Mike. By extension, Catherine is also now safe, and Dave sets his eye instead on MJ Delfino. Following his recent break-in at a neighbor's house, Orson tells his doctor that the woman who saw him break into her home has dementia. She doesn't know what she's talking about. He is done stealing things. Bree discovers, though, that he is lying and tells Andrew she thinks it's time to divorce Orson. Season 5, episode 21. Juanita wears a full face of makeup to school after seeing Gabby on the cover of a magazine. Juanita wants to wear makeup to her dad's work party because she wants to look pretty like her mom. So Carlo suggests that neither of them wear makeup. Gabby is very hesitant to do so, but because she knows it will be good for Juanita to see her being confident without makeup, she goes to the party without. But then Carlos is winning an award, so Gabby has to be pictured. She doesn't want to be photographed without her makeup. It creates some really interesting inner conflict for Gabby, where she believes Juanita is beautiful without makeup. She doesn't want her to start feeling like she needs to wear makeup to be beautiful. She's like six years old, but Gabby can't even believe those things herself. I actually think this plot is a very interesting look at internalized misogyny and body image issues and lots of things that Gabby as well as Juanita have been struggling with or put up against this season. Um, of all of Juanita's storylines about her body image and her self-esteem, I think this one is the best because it comes back to themes that I think a lot of people, whether you are a big sister or a mother or big brother, whatever, can relate to. Um, so yeah, Jackson proposes to Susan. And Susan breaks down, confessing her love to Jackson and how much this means to her. And then Jackson reveals he doesn't want to marry Susan because he loves her, but because he needs his green card, because um, he's Canadian. Either way, Susan agrees to marry him. Bree hires Carl to help her with her divorce. He only agrees to help her out, though, if he can get MJ to invite his son to his party. Bree has to do a little convincing with MJ, but he ends up getting an invitation, so Carl is officially Bree's lawyer. And finally, let's check in on Dave. Detectives show up, and they tell Dave that they managed to ID the man who died in the fire. They also tell Dave that they have testimony that Jackson was seen backstage. So now Jackson is sort of tied in with the whole thing because this is a threat to Dave, obviously. Jackson also throws a wrench in Dave's plans because Dave plans to take MJ and Susan out on a little trip, but because Jackson wants to get married right away, they have to cancel their plans. Season 5, episode 22. Gabby takes Juanita to a soup kitchen to volunteer so that she'll be a little more grateful for what she has. Here, Gabby runs into an old friend who is eating at the soup kitchen and she is so stunned that somebody she knows and cares about could be poor like this. Um, which is kind of funny because Gabby just spent five years being completely broke, so truly could barely afford the very basics to take care of her family. So I don't know why she's so surprised, but the friend ends up telling Gabby, quote, we are all just an accident or a tumor away from losing everything. And God damn, if that's not American economics for you, I don't know what to tell you. The storyline coming from Gabby after we just saw her struggling to provide for her family for the whole first half of season five is a little confusing to me, but I think the message here they managed to put in, especially as the show has begun to comment on the recession, is uh, pretty powerful. So at least they found a way to get it in, I guess. Susan begins announcing to everyone that she and Jackson are getting married. Catherine is thrilled because this means that Susan and Mike won't be able to get remarried because Susan's marrying someone else. Mike tells Catherine he would like to get married. Susan stops by Catherine's and Catherine is on the phone with Dave. So she puts the phone down, but Dave is still on the phone and Susan tells Catherine that it's a fake wedding. 
The reason she has to do this is because if Mike thinks that the wedding is real, then he will discontinue the child support slash alimony he's been paying Susan. She tells Mike that it's fake and asks him to continue paying that because she's just trying to help Jackson out. Um, Susan is no stranger to fraudulent weddings. As you may recall, a few seasons ago, she remarried Carl so that she could have his health insurance to get her spleen removed. Dave is becoming increasingly stressed that Jackson may go to the police and tell them that he had something to do potentially with the fire that night. So Dave decides to nip the problem in the bud and he calls immigration on Jackson and he is taken away and no wedding can take place. Finally, for Bree, Carl suggests that Bree stage a robbery against herself in order to give herself less assets which will just simplify things in the divorce. So during a party, she and Carl dress up in all black and break into her house and hide everything in a storage unit. Then Brie takes Orson home and she goes, Orson, we've been robbed. And his reply, it wasn't me, I swear. I think, I think this might be the funniest exchange in all of season five, to be totally honest with you. Brie goes to Carl's office to speak with him again, and she explains that divorce is really scary because she thinks that no one will ever love her again. And unfortunately, Orson discovers the storage unit where she hid all of their things. Season five, episode 23. Carlos has an aunt who is terminally ill, and she also has a granddaughter. She needs somebody else to take the granddaughter in because she won't be able to care for her anymore. And everyone suggests that Carlos and Gabby be the ones to do it because they have the money and the means to take in a teenager. Carlos reluctantly tells his aunt that he will do it. And the aunt appears to be hiding some information about Anna. Scavos. Tom is struggling to find a new job and he decides he wants to go back to college to study Chinese. Lynette is not at all amused by this and spends the whole episode just flabbergasted. But it turns out that Tom wants to learn Chinese because it would really help with business if he could speak Chinese. He could work on marketing with international companies. It would just provide a lot more opportunities. He's not just picking a random major. Since he does have a plan, she decides to support him. Susan begins to suspect that perhaps it is Mike who called immigration on Jackson. But when she goes over to confront Mike about it, Catherine tells her that she and Mike plan to get married. Brie officially tells Orson she wants a divorce. This scene is everything. Probably my favorite Brie scene of the entire season. Marsha leaves no crumbs at this dinner table. Orson has already reported the robbery to the insurance company, essentially blackmailing Brie here because if the insurance company finds out that Brie committed fraud, she could be in very big legal trouble. Roberta is back. She and Karen put together that he is the one who killed Dr. Heller in the fire at the bar. They agree to break into Dave's to look for more hints about what's going on. Finally, on to Susan, Mike, and Dave. Dave is still planning to kill MJ, and he makes a videotape explaining why. He really wants to move fast and get this thing over with. Dave brings the tape to Mike. He tells him to watch it after he gets home from his honeymoon with Catherine. And then Dave, MJ, and Susan depart on their fishing trip. Now for the season finale, season five, episode 24. We'll wrap things up one character at a time as usual for the finale. For the Solis family, we close out the season with the arrival of Anna. I will place Anna on the wall next season. Um, but she has arrived and she is manipulative and sneaky and just a lot of trouble, which is why Carlos's aunt was so relieved to get this girl off her hands. The Scavo family. Tom gets into college. Lynette is beginning to not feel very well, so she calls her doctor and informs him that she thinks her cancer might be back. She goes to the doctor. It's not cancer. She is pregnant. Her reply, are you sure it's not cancer? Brie Vandekamp. Brie goes to Carl and explains the whole mess with Orson. He tells her not to worry about it. He will take care of it. While Orson is home, a man arrives, beats him up, and threatens him, telling him it's time to let go. Brie can't believe that Carl would hire someone to beat Orson up and threaten him, so she goes to confront him. 
And then Carl, nasty, dirty, womanizer Carl, begins to flirt with Brie. She is not as disgusted as we may expect her to be. He tells her he thinks she wants him to walk over there and kiss her until her knees buckle. He walks over and kisses her. And she pulls back after a moment and says, my knees haven't buckled yet. <laughs> the scandal! Oh my god. We already have people dating each other's exes and everything. So it's not even that. It's just like, this is the ultimate bad boy of the neighborhood, you know? Like, this is not a good man. He is slimy. He staged the whole robbery. He had the whole idea. He had someone beat up Orson. He's just very enthralled by Brie, I think. And Brie, who has tried for so many years to be perfect, everything falls apart anyway. So I think she's reached a point where she's like, why does it matter? I'm going to do what I want because life sucks. All right. Finally, let's bring the whole Dave, Mike, Susan thing to a close. At the airport where he's planning to go on this trip with Catherine, Mike watches the video of Dave's on his video camera. He immediately flees the airport and Catherine assumes that she has been abandoned. Mike calls Susan and tells her what's going on and tells her she needs to remain calm and not let Dave know that she knows what's happening. MJ really needs to use the bathroom and all Dave will do is let them pull over. Um, so then there's a chase through the woods, but unfortunately, both Susan and MJ are recaptured in this fight. Since Dave now knows that Mike is rushing to meet them, he has a new plan. He plans to make Susan watch while Mike rushes through the intersection, the same intersection where Paige and Lila Dash were killed, and he plans to meet Mike's car in the intersection, thus making Susan watch Mike kill their child in a car accident. We watch this car accident happen. While Susan wails for MJ, who is presumably dead in the back seat, we hear MJ call for his mother. Dave apparently told him to get out of the car before he actually went through with the plan. And turns out Mike is okay too. The little family of three all embrace each other. Susan and Mike kiss, and Dave returns to the mental hospital. The season ends two months later with a wedding. Mike is marrying a woman, and we don't know which woman it is. The end. See you season six. All right, as usual, let me give you some closing thoughts on season five. As I look back through my notes, I think season five is indeed the weakest season of the show because it doesn't even have that strong of a through line. Because Dave is not a permanent member of the cast, I would say that season five has the most in common with season two's mystery. We're just this new isolated family that the story concerns. Because at least with season three, it was all tied to Brie, which I touched on a little bit earlier. Although yes, Dave is married to Edie, that tie and Edie's presence as a character isn't quite strong enough anymore. If this had been season four instead of season five, and we had just come off of Edie having three really strong seasons where she's heavily featured, it might be a different story. But its placement as season five, this season is just kind of a mess. If we focus on what it actually does for the show, it basically just takes us over that time jump. We have many plots that are disconnected, but they still inform who the characters are and how their lives have changed in the last five years. So I'm not saying it's a bad season. I think where the season falls short is the mystery's integration into everything as a whole. Season four, although Catherine's mystery really only affected Catherine, it didn't bother me as much because we had a lot of Catherine and the other women doing things, um, especially Brie, but she already had this connection to Susan. So its function was just different. Like, yes, it was a smaller mystery, but the character is what was important. You can't say the same thing about Dave, whose entire purpose as a character was to come and pose a threat to Susan and Mike. I'll talk about this more in following videos, but like season two, season six also has a family who moves into town, has their own isolated storyline, and then I won't spoil what happens, but it feels very different from this one because it still manages to involve so many different characters. It focuses on them as characters, 
much like they did with Catherine. And season six has two major mysteries as opposed to just what's wrong with the weird new neighbors. I finished my complete rewatch of the series about a week and a half ago, and I'm so, so excited to cover season six, seven, and eight. So if you enjoyed this video and the others in this series so far, please give it a, a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss the following videos. I think there will be one video in a new series before I publish my season six Desperate Housewives video. These recaps take a lot of time, so I'm going to do something a little simpler, I think, as a video in between things, but I hope you will like it and watch it even if you're only here for Desperate Housewives, which is okay. Thank you again to my Umfi playing Jane, as well as Maddie for your support on Kofi. You can find my Kofi link below if you want to support my season six Desperate Housewives video. Gotta get some new pictures printed, you know, that kind of stuff. Thank you so much for your support on the channel and these videos, because um, I've been having a lot of fun making them, and I'm glad you enjoy too. We are going to have an absolute blast with the final three seasons of the show. It truly only goes up from here. So I hope to see you there. And have a nice day. Okay, bye.